Καλησπέρα σε όλους. Ευχαριστούμε για την οικονομή σας. Απογλούμαστε για την μικρή καθυστέρηση. Απόψε θα παρακολουθήσουμε την τελευταία διάλεξη του επίκουρου καθηγητή Ράμι Σάρεχ, ο οποίος επισκέπτεται το Ανοιχτό Πανεπιστήμιο Κύπρου στα πλαίσια του προγράμματος Εράσμος. Η σημερινή διάλεξη του α, αγαπητού α, δόκτωρ Σάδεκ θα, θα ασχοληθεί με το θέμα α, της τηλεϊατρικής και της τηλεϊγείας. Τελεμέρισης και τηλεχέλθ. Δόκτωρ Σάδεκ, thank you for uh, uh, this uh, last but not least presentation on telemedicine and telehealth. Please, uh, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Hello, everyone. It's nice uh, to see you tonight also as well. It was a pleasure having you all the week uh, and the past few days, uh, you know, sharing, uh, sharing the information and being able to, uh, you know, having this exchange uh, program. Today we'll be talking about telehealth and telemedicine in the context of uh, COVID-19. Uh, I hope you uh, will like the presentation. We already talked about and touched base on uh, several topics related uh, to telehealth and telemedicine, but we will go in a little bit further details and uh, overall, uh, you know, brief inter interview of uh, overview of uh, what telehealth and what telemedicine is, is and the benefits of having them in any case of a pandemic and you'll be able to beneficially using them in the right way. So I'll start uh, with uh, the files here. Okay, um, I hope you, you are able to see the, uh, uh, the presentation here with the slides. If not, please uh, just uh, send me a message through the uh, platform. Um, okay, telehealth and telemedicine in the context of uh, COVID-19. Uh, telehealth was defined as an overall service and the services that can be provided through electronic communication. And this only does not, uh, is lim not li limited to therapy or uh, medications uh, only, but even can be extended to any assistant uh, health related uh, services. For example, uh, therapy, physical therapy, occupation therapy, health promotion, health prevention and even can be extended furthermore to involve education, consultation, advice, monitoring of uh, intervention, monitoring of medications. So there is a wide range of services that can be uh, uh, delivered and served through uh, the technolo technology and electronic communication. And shortly we will see how this can be delivered and what kind of technology we can use to deliver the health services. On the other hand, telemedicine is a very specific part of our specialized uh, uh, scope or use of telehealth. It's more pertained to the serving the patients or be able to treat the patients. Uh, of course, because it has more patients data and dealing with patients, it's more of a private service and confidential service because it includes patients data. Uh, so both of them are basically serving the uh, commun community and the population. But when you come more toward clinical uh, application and medical application, this is called uh, telemedicine. And you will see this is more uh, of interest of physicians because they use it as a way to uh, virtually care for their patients. The scope of telehealth is very wide, as we mentioned. Anything you can think of that we use in a regular way, in, in a physical way, you can apply to telehealth. Of course, there are some limitations that we will discuss shortly, but if you think from prevention, promotion, education, treatment, uh, awareness, consultation, even campaigning, uh, uh, medication uh, prescription and delivering of medication, uh, check up, follow up, it's all can be done through uh, telehealth. There is a wide scope of telehealth that showed success 
over the last few years, especially, specifically the last two years. Telemedicine is more of, a, as I mentioned, medical, uh, you know, scope that you treat the patient and you follow up the patient regarding the medication of the patient and the health of the patient and be able to refer the patient based on the diagnosis and treatment that you virtually uh, identified through the virtual care of telemedicine. During the COVID-19, telemedicine was successfully applied in diagnosing diseases, you know, mild diseases, and be able even to follow up with patients, including uh, COVID-19 patients, those, those that have, who have re rehabilitated and survived the disease will be able to be followed up and uh, uh, prescribe some drugs and supporting drugs, medications like vitamins and so forth and so on. Uh, also in, in medicine, it was uh, uh, successfully applied in surveilling and be able to monitor the new cases, the condition of the cases reporting uh, morbidity and mortality due to COVID-19 and be able to triage some patients even virtually through uh, telemedicine. The overall success of telemedicine has been presented uh, by the uh, vice president of the AMA, who said that it's not a matter of introducing telemedicine, telehealth and telemedicine right now services. It's already there, it's already been used, but it's the uh, thinking of uh, having a full integration and uh, of in-person service and care of this virtual health. So it's not only if we are able to use it, it's already been uh, used, but it's a matter of how we can fully integrate and be able to make it in a fully clinical, uh, 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 help, helpful way for patients to evaluate the patients and treat them within the scope of the clinical appropriateness. And we will mention this clinical appropriateness because it's very important. There are some cases you can't completely serve the patient due to some clinical limitations and abilities. Before the pandemic, it was already introduced and suggested by the WHO as one way to serve rural area and distant area. And it was useful and there are some even successful stories that happened before the emergence of COVID-19. However, after the emergence of COVID-19, this become even more successful and the uh, thinking and consideration of COVID-19 became much more uh, you know, serious and significantly increased in the last two years. There's a nice video that I came across on YouTube. You can watch yourself, see how the uh, COVID-19 uh, significantly uh, increased uh, uh, the use of uh, COVID-19 and made success in uh, uh, delivering services for, for so many patients, including COVID-19 patients. It's a nice video if you would like to watch later. There is some statistics you can see. Uh, basically, from 70 to 75 to over 70 percent, I'm trying to collectively represent these data. Care providers were uh, actually more motivated to use uh, co uh, to use telehealth and telemedicine and the services uh, after they tried it in, in uh, during COVID-19. Uh, they said they were also able to uh, deliver good and high quality of services uh, for their patients. Uh, they said they would prefer to use it even continuously in the uh, future. And we will see a survey, a national survey that happened in the U.S. Uh, significantly trying to, uh, ancestrally trying to show the exact, you know, percentages of those uh, providers who were able and successfully uh, applied uh, telehealth and telemedicine during the uh, uh, pandemic. These are, by the way, almost global numbers. The, the, the most I could actually collect from different studies and different countries uh, you know, I tried just to put some percentages here to just uh, represent and uh, provide an overview of the data uh, that I came across and the studies that I uh, briefly came uh, came over. Uh, also, patients were uh, happy to, to have uh, this kind of service and they showed a higher interest to have it in the future the way they received it during COVID-19. Okay, these are numbers uh, again. There's actually, if you can, we don't have to read each a single number in billions, but you can notice from uh, 2019 until 2020, which is this year, we saw a dramatic and significant increase in the investment that has globally been uh, 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 provided and, and uh, you know, suggested and been applied in, in the uh, market of telehealth. Uh, there is a, a high growth, uh, annual growth rate 
that happened even in, in this year compared to the previous year. And it is expected that if telehealth continued the same way, it will even grow larger uh, to have uh, two, over 270 uh, billion uh, uh, investment uh, in the market of telehealth and telemedicine by 2026 with, uh, you know, 27 or more uh, of uh, annual growth rate uh, at that time. So you can see that there was a significant growth even, you know, from two, uh, 2019 to 2020, but that even significantly increased by 2021 and 2022, showing that the telehealth is gaining, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, more uh, of an interest by the providers, organizations, and patients as well. So this is the, this is in US. So the previous ones was in overall estimations. Most of the data, to be honest, uh, I found in US studies, but this is specifically in US alone. So again, if you look at the numbers 20 here at the right, 2019 uh, and to 2021 between these two years, and 2021, there's a high increase in the revenues that, uh, related to the uh, telehealth uh, use and telehealth funding. Uh, it's almost doubled in, in one year uh, in the U.S., and this is in billions of dollars. And if you look at these lines here, the, the uh, lower one is 2017, all the way to the upper one, which is dark blue in 2020. You can notice the increase in four years only, or three years only, from six billion to almost 15 billion of investment in the telehealth and telemedicine. So, uh, basically, there is a high and significant increase in telehealth uh, market and uh, funding. Also, this is a, a, another representation of data statistics uh, in, in the U.S. Uh, in 2019, the patient's use, this is a consumer or patient's use of telehealth, was on, uh, only 11%. By 2021, this is two years after, it doubled seven times. It became 76% of those not only using because they have to use, but also interested in keep using telehealth throughout uh, their you know healthcare life. Uh, regarding the providers, there was a 50 to 175 uh, multifold increase in the interest and use by the healthcare providers, including a wide range of providers. You can hear mental health, you know health uh, independent practices in the use of COVID-19, in the, in the use of telehealth, even uh, during COVID-19 and after COVID-19. But during COVID-19 in 2021, there is a 50 to almost, you know, 170 increase, multifold increase in the provider interest of using telehealth and telemedicine and their services. And in addition, as you know, very similar to the previous slide of the global uh, statistics, there is from 50 to, you know, 60 in, in, uh, increase or interest and their views about telehealth as a favorable way to be used, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, for for the services, then they did have this view before the emergence of COVID-19. So there's a favorable use, and you know, uh, the press, you know, the the overall opinion has actually improved uh, by the providers as well. Uh, also, the, very quickly, you can see here that from, uh, and this is a monthly increase. So it was almost a straight line in 2019, all the way until the beginning of 2020 for the investment that has been, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, done or applied uh, regarding telehealth. Uh, in the, and this is in statistics in the US. Mm -hmm. But then there was a sudden increase since the emergence in March 2020 of COVID-19 to be from 2% to 13%. And just right in April, the, just one month after that in April, it increased to be, to be 49%. And from, you know, uh, one actually, see, it's one, all, one uh, 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 less than one million dollar in investment in, in that month, which is actually one uh, half of a million, to be 12 million uh, investment in, in one month. So it even uh, a month, uh, uh, of the difference made millions of dollars uh, multifolded increase in the investment and growth of uh, the use of uh, telehealth uh, after the emergence of COVID-19. So you, you can see that after April, it slightly, you know, decreased to be 10 million, then 9 million, and 
so you know then became almost uh, uh, you know uh, stable here from august and these are actually summer months uh, all the way and until december and there are some explanations that you know people had only one choice uh, from march and april and may to use only telehealth because you know, the beginning of the pandemic so many places closed even in the us and health services were physically um, uh, you know suspended however after that after the some of places were open some people still prefer to be physically uh, seeing their doctors and providing uh, the uh, and having the receiving the service in person however some suggestions also said that during summer months uh, the virus itself was uh, you know um, decreased and the spread was further or less than it used to be in winter times so this way people were moving and be able you know trying to communicate and socialize and also they wanted to socialize with their healthcare provider so uh, regardless the the uh, reason there is a tremendous increase and a huge increase in the use uh, of telehealth after the emergence of COVID-19 as shown in this figure. Okay, the methods of adoption. Uh, quickly, you know, can read these small uh, prescriptions here for each one of them. There is a sync asynchronous and synchronous use and other uses. So asynchronous is, is not a mutual uh, and vital and, uh, you know, live uh, use of telehealth. So basically, this is when the patient uh, send out the information for the healthcare provider and they don't receive the answer at the same time. So it's a not a, a live uh, a virtual contact at the same time with, with the provider. Uh, you know, they just send out the information through email or a portal system uh, to be uh, evaluated by the healthcare provider. And later on, they receive the answer or the recommendation or the advice or even sometimes the diagnosis uh, and instructions, health instructions over their cell phone, email or any mode of, uh, you know, uh, communication. So this is asynchronous. It does not happen at the same time. This is the means of asynchronous. However, synchronous, it happens, the service happens at the same time, which means both the healthcare provider or the medical doctor uh, see and communicate with the patient at the same time. They are both on the screen, seeing and talking to each other at the same time. This is where evaluation happens. Acute cases are evaluated. Um, if if uh, any case of emergency is uh, 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 services are provided, because they need to be in a, a synchronous at the same time services. So basically, asynchronous and synchronous are the most likely common way of medical. So this is more of medical, you know, uh, modalities for transferring and uh, providing services. These two are more of uh, community, you know, uh, population related services, which is a remote patient monitoring. So if you have a patient who have high blood pressure or high, you know, glucose uh, levels or, or, you know, and you need to monitor this patient, this is a way or a mode to monitoring. So basically this is only to monitor the, um, uh, the patient, uh, you know, uh, readings, uh, you know, uh, reading can be weight, uh, height, blood sugar or cholesterol levels or anything. Or you can monitor the health and, you know, general overview uh, of the patient's uh, rating of their health and, you know, self-satisfaction of the service they previous. So this is basically for monitoring. It's, can, it's a milder use of, you know, uh, telemedicine. There is a more of a public health use of telemedicine, a more population-based of telemedicine, which is mobile health. And I'm sure uh, this was applied here in Cyprus and Jordan as well, where you have these mobile application and people can log, log in and see different things, health and related information. And this is only not related to COVID-19, but can be done and applied the, throughout the, the year. So these are the different modalities that are used, uh, you know, uh, at the same uh, at the time of COVID-19 or can be used anytime, but, you know, the, these are the, the, the main ones. Okay, uh, you can see from this figure, this is the, basically the percentages of uh, different kind of technologies that can be used for telehealth and telemedicine. And if you look for uh, telephone and video or live video, so basically video talking, seeing the care health provider provides over than 50% of the application used by the uh, consumers. It's almost, I can tell here, it's 55% or even 60% uh, that, uh, you know, uh, is, is the use of uh, video related or calling related application. 
and it's easy to expect that because people like to talk and see their healthcare provider rather than social networking or smartphone applications or online programs. It's less, uh, you know, preferable by the general population. Specifically, that it might need, you know, time to, uh, you know, download the application and read about the instructions, having connection, things like that. So, uh, a telephone or a video is expected to have this higher, higher percentage of. Uh, use because of the easiness and uh, similar feeling of a real uh, communication with the healthcare provider. This is basically the models of virtual care. So models of virtual care is the ways the care could be delivered on and the reasons of having the care delivered this way. So this is basically a model of how to virtually uh, 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 deliver the care based on the need. The first one is called on-demand, on-demand virtual urgent care. This is when you have an urgent care that has to be uh, uh, evaluated and connected with the patient and communicated right on demand because of the urgent care, like a severe injury, shortness of breath, uh, sudden increase of the high pressure. So you need that care based on the urgent demand of this uh, you know, case. Uh, the second one is called virtual office visit. So from the names or the terms, you can see it's a, like an office visit. It's like you want to visit, but you will visit virtually. And this is when you do some sort of evaluation for the mental health, chronic disease, follow-up, things like that. So this is like an, a regular office visit. It's not an urgent one, but you do that virtually. There's something similar to virtual, but it's called near virtual. And this is when you have a, a patient who needs further testing by a nearby physical site. So you, uh, for example, a physician will tell the patient, you know, you need some lab work, please go to the closest lab or the nearby lab to take some blood, blood from you or do some blood, lab work or things like that. So this is when you do a service virtually, but you still need some help from a nearby community center or a lab or, you know, uh, clinic and near the patient to complete your uh, visit. And there is something called virtual home uh, health services, which is basically it's like a home service, which be older people or people with disability have, or people who need help have uh, for rehabilitation, evaluation, education, consultation, advice, uh, training, teaching, things like that. So you do that virtually. Sometimes in these cases, a nurse or a physical therapist or a health educator or social health educator will come and visit actually for the first time to, to provide instructions and um, uh, show the patients how to use the application uh, and uh, virtually communicate with the provider in the future cases. So maybe the first visit is virtual, later on it becomes, uh, I'm sorry, the first visit is physical, then becomes virtual. The fifth one is called uh, tick enabled home medication administration, and this is uh, to monitor medications. So a diabetic patient who's taking insulin, we can teach this patient how to take the medication for the first time. Then we can monitor that virtually through the you know internet, the camera, mobile phone of the patient is taking that correctly on you know different occasion, different time. If the dose is fine, especially if these patients who have some sort of uh, low health literacy, uh, low level of education, uh, have some sort of diseases, we try to monitor them over a period of time to make sure that they are. Uh, you know, monitor the uh, monitoring the uh, medication in the right way. Uh, okay, this is to just very quickly uh, tell that there are some efforts that has been done by some organizations. For example, the AMA, 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 AMA is the American Medical Association. They actually made a guidance of how to uh, score telehealth immersion program, which is a program that showed the you know caregivers how to optimize the use of of telehealth. So to use it at the best in the best way and best manner and be able to apply it, uh, you know, in the optimum way. So this is a, a guidance. You can actually just uh, look it up, Google it, and find uh, you know some instructions and guidance for care, caregiver, caregivers regarding the telehealth use. Another framework that has been adapted and developed by the AIM as well, called the framework return on health. And return on health means that the, what is the benefits that are returned on health. Uh, for using telehealth and they showed the you know some sort of evidence-based uh, benefits uh, of telehealth use uh, 
related to clinical outcomes, access to care, uh, family and patient satisfaction, uh, even the satisfaction of the clinician and clinical experience, and uh, some financial operation impact health equity uh, and how people became more equal through the, uh, this framework. So the framework is like a, a model uh, which showed uh, the benefits of using telehealth uh, uh, to people. So they would uh, actually be more convinced that telehealth is something that can be used and be applied uh, in the future and it's for their benefits, uh, including these, uh, you know, six factors that were used in the framework uh, and they are actually mandatory factors uh, related to uh, health services and care management. Okay, this is one example of a study, a real study that was a wide, uh, nationwide and wide scope uh, uh, study applied in the US uh, uh, for all the states showing the impact of telehealth and you know it has the results that we will findings we will show shortly to see uh, if telehealth really helped and have some health benefits especially you know some of the core uh, recommendations uh, that we talked about previously like improving uh, health for minorities, improving health in rural areas, improving health of people with disadvantages. So we will see the, the telehealth impact study. Telehealth impact study actually completed in 2021, and it had actually three sources of data. The first source was claims, uh, you know, uh, and this is insurance claims. Insurance claims, basically, this works when the people take the, the service or receive the service, then they go to their insurance and say, we receive this kind of service. In the case uh, of COVID-19, there was um, uh, an item saying, did you receive the service physically or through telehealth? So uh, people who receive service, services through telehealth, they were choosing or selecting telehealth service and claimed to be reimbursed. Reimbursed many, meaning if they paid any money or copay or they were asked to pay money, uh, they actually uh, asked their insurance company or if they are supported by the go uh, government to pay the provider for the services they received through telehealth. So actually this study, the authors were able to analyze the data that was uh, you know, published through the claims uh, or able to take the claims of the uh, insured people and be able to analyze this data. And also they made a survey for providers. They were asking providers, uh, including physicians, nurses, uh, physician assistants, different kind of questions and we will actually show the main uh, outcomes and also they asked patients about their satisfaction rate uh, their happiness uh, if they will uh, favor uh, this uh, you know service in the future so they collected data from the patients the providers and from the insurance and we able to analyze that this is basically i know this is a small word but this is basically showed for each state you have 50 states in this uh, us in america and showed the use of, of telehealth, uh, you know, uh, from July 2019 to July 2020. So over one uh, year, part of it was before Corona, and part of it was uh, uh, after Corona. And, you know, lighter color means less use and darker colors means more use. You can see some states have a higher use and you can easily tell that the eastern part and northeastern part of America, which is more developed and highly populated, use the uh, telehealth and telemedicine more often than southern state and you know midwest except uh, uh, one state here which is i think iowa so it, it depends on the state but generally there was an overall you know uh, view it depends on the population and development and mentality of the population okay the the findings the main findings of the telehealth impact study from the provider perspective, remember we, they ask the patients and the provider different questions. When they asked me about what medical problems were being addressed through telehealth, they said mostly mental and behavioral problems. So they, they, they said they, most of the problems they saw and uh, you know, addressed and uh, were able to treat and diagnose through telehealth in the last, in this year actually, from July 2019 to July 2020, were mental and behavioral health, and there was almost tenfold increase before the pandemic. They asked also the providers what the barriers to maintain telehealth after COVID-19. They said reimbursement. So I would actually expect this because this is just at the beginning of the pandemic. Imagine even before the you know the beginning, which was 2020, 2019, 2020. So I'm sure there were some problems with reimbursement, you know, calling 
the insurance and you know defining the care they had and be able to reimburse so uh, i'm sure that was a problem at the beginning maybe it improved later on and technology used by pay patient because this is of course expected the technology to use in health is something new to many patients and you can't imagine how many actually patients in the states don't you know how to use the technology the way we use so it's not about the country or the you know place or, or it depends on the, on the person what is the ask the also uh, providers what is the preferable care to continue via, uh, via telehealth telehealth and telemedicine after COVID-19 and they said we would like to we prefer and we would like to see uh, uh, chronic disease uh, patients and manage them through telehealth. So, because chronic diseases need a lot of monitoring and follow-up visits, so they said maybe this is the easiest and most convenient way to follow them up through telemedicine. They also asked them how did the patient connect with you through telehealth. They said through a patient portal. So they have a special portal, link or portal that they can connect and communicate through with their care providers. When they ask the patients about their perspective, and here are some statistics, and I put average because I saw the lowest number and the highest number for each of them. When they ask the patients, do you prefer it over in-person in uh, appointments? 30 to 46% said yes, and it depends on the state. So the lowest state was 30, and the highest state was, and state in America was the 46. So it depends on the state, the you know preferable was different. And there is a rating for the following items, and this is based on age. So they actually uh, divided uh, the groups in different uh, in different age groups, and they were actually uh, trying to estimate their uh, you know preferences over that time. So they asked them was the provider thorough, and uh, over 80% they said yes, the, the the provider was thorough. They asked was the quality of communication good? They said. Or it was again 80% of or more said the communication was good and quality of communication was good. Was good. Uh, they asked them about their privacy. Was the information secure? And they answered also yes. And then they said the last question: Will you use it? And this is basically collectively. You know, I try to collect, collect the uh, answer and make them uh, you know, summarize them. They asked, Will you continue using it in the future? And over 70%. So a little bit lower, but uh, most of them said yes. They will be. Uh, you're willing to use it in the, in the future. Okay, conclusions of uh, uh, telehealth, you know. Uh, the impact study said that uh, COVID-19 was a catalyst to use uh, telehealth and, uh, and adopt it in the future. Uh, many providers and patients uh, had their first experience during uh, COVID-19 for telehealth use. So this is amazing that many uh, of them were the first time to use telehealth because of the uh, pandemic. Uh, the, the pandemic, uh, you know, uh, it's not only the thing that uh, were addressed, was only, not only COVID-19 uh, uh, patients were only diagnosed and uh, examined through this service, but also a wide range of health outcomes were uh, addressed as well. Uh, providers and, and patients for them, them were satisfied, highly satisfied to use telehealth, uh, you know, that this is the main outcomes of the, you know, the, uh, uh, the study. Uh, also, further research is needed. This is the advice or recommendation from the authors. Okay, this is a resource that I would like you to see uh, here up Telehealth Resource Center. I, when I was, you know, seeing different kind of information, I found this resource to be very useful. Although it's mainly about, you know, the US again, uh, but uh, honestly, uh, you, the US was the, almost the best country to use telehealth during during the. Uh, the pandemic and actually they publish a lot of information uh, and feedback of the use uh, uh, of COVID, uh, you know, of telehealth during COVID-19. So this is one was one of the sources that developed recently, and it showed so it has so so many information, different kind of information that you can use for your own uh, 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 favor and, and sake if you'd like to gain more knowledge and have you know uh, some sort of uh, you know, different aspects about telehealth use. Okay, okay. this is <laughs> telehealth in Cyprus. I tried to Google uh, that before I, you know, uh, collected the, these slides and put them all together. And you can correct me in this because you are uh, more experienced uh, about Cyprus than myself. So what, from what I found that uh, Ministry of Health was really interested, even before COVID-19, I read 
was since the 2017, 2018, they were, uh, you know, uh, really in interested in improving health uh, through electronic services. So there was something called e-health where, where every, everything was electronized uh, and they want to actually go with that furthermore. It was first applied in Nicosia General Hospital or Nicosia General Hospital and uh, Famagusta General Hospital. I know the Nicosia General Hospital because I saw that, but I know I don't know the Famagusta General Hospital. But eHealth was first adapted into these uh, hospitals. Uh, it's an integrated health, so integration of information from uh, different uh, you know facilities with the Ministry of Health, and it consists of 13 subsystems uh, showing different kind of healthcare services provided through the eHealth system. Um, the the Ministry of Health is aiming to have, create a regional health networks. So they can change, exchange information in the real time. So this is the next step of the, um, you know, Cyprus and Ministry of Health in Cyprus aim to have this system to develop to uh, and, and advance further more to exchange information. And please correct me in, in this after we, we go over the next few slides. In Jordan, there is something called e-government. So the, basically I'm comparing Cyprus to, you know, my, my country. E-government basically is actually um, applied uh, several years ago, and it was the aim of this was to electronic, electronically transferring information and communication and uh, services in all kinds of government sectors to be more electronic. Uh, during the pandemic and health-related uh, things, uh, there was mobile applications and websites. So mobile applications were something called Aman, and websites there was a website through the Ministry of Health. Uh, showing all the updates, um, especially at the beginning, they were very active to have updates and uh, ways of precautions and things like that. But after that, you know, things start to slow down. Uh, there was actually a suggestion. This is only a suggestion, something called National Telemedicine Program. I don't think that this ever actually uh, was put on ground. Uh, there was also random efforts to have uh, telemedicine through the Ministry of Health, just uh, some sort of... Um, very local applications for, through the Ministry of Health, the Royal uh, Medical Services and the Cancer Center in Amman also were trying. And Cancer Center in Amman, I know a few years ago, they have some sort of electronic, uh, you know, uh, health system in, inside the center to be able to transfer information and record the uh, visits and things like that. Uh, three platforms were developed during the pandemic, Cisco systems, Hakim, uh, I never used it. People were talking about it. And Al-Tabibi. And Al-Tabibi, honestly, I never heard about it before preparing this slide. So there are some efforts, but you can see that they are scattered effort, not uh, you know, collective and uh, uh, you know, very clear uh, you know, uh, efforts that are done in a, a very organized way. Okay, here are some examples. I would like here to hear some participations from you, if you don't mind. So we, we said before that, uh, you know, there was a, a, the a vice president of AMA of digital use, uh, care use, said that, you know, within the clinical appropriateness, if, if you remember this word, clinical appropriateness, we can use telemedicine for uh, in full investigation and, and uh, uh, you know, care of the patients. Uh, but there are some limitations. So I want you to have these examples and compare them. Which, in which one of these cases in different you know, care uh, uh, types. Which one could be medicine more applied? For the first one, if you have a wide spread pain in your body, you can use still medicine. Or in the case if you have tender and swollen joints for patients with rheumatoid arthritis, which one do you think, comparing these two only, can telemedicine be applied more and which one less? And if you tell me why, it would be great. Any suggestions, anything? Yeah, go ahead, please, uh, Marina. Uh, yes, hello. Thank you for a very interesting presentation. Um, OK, I would go for the second case, that you already, let's say, have a, have a uh, diagnosis. So uh, you, it's a situation you can, let's say, monitor through telemedicine. There's no need to visit. Very good. 
Very, very good, Marina. Thank you. Thank you. This is a very good point. It's already been diagnosed, right? So you just follow up. But widespread pain, we don't know. We don't know. This is very good. Any, any, any addition? This is very good from Marina. Thank you. Okay, let's go to the second case. Skin rashes vs. Dark, darkly pigmented lesions in dermatology. So which one do you think can be more applied and be easier to uh, have through telemedicine? Which one? What do you think? Okay, any suggestion? I would say, Marina, please, uh, you know, help us again. <laughs> what do you think? Anyone? I, I would say the darkly pigmented lesions again. Uh, since it's again something that needs a follow up and could be possibly measured uh, remotely, it's not so difficult. Well, so, I might actually. An assumption. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, thank you, Marina. I'm happy you, you said. Actually, from what I read, I want to go actually against this uh, because usually if you have a dark pigmentation, it might uh, tell you about something more uh, serious, which needs further inv investigation and probably a biopsy to see why you have this dark pigmentations over your body. Skin rashes is usually these rashes, redness that happen from allergy or, you know, have some uh, sort of... Uh, insect bite or something and, and you get this uh, inflammatory response and you monitor actually you might monitor at the beginning then i'm not a dermatologist dermatologist but I, this is what i read but when you have more serious uh, you know condition you, which needs investigation this way telemedicine have some sort of limited uh, application but again you might be right but this is what, from what i read thank you marin i would like to hear your voice again also, again, high blood pressure vs shortness of breath of a cardiac patient. Which was which one telemedicine should be you could be applied easily? What do you think? First answers because we would like to move to another slide. Any suggestions? Okay, high blood pressure you can monitor actually uh, easily, and, and and you know you can tell the patient what to do. But if you have shortness of breath of a cardiac patient, this is serious. And it might tell you about something like a cardiac arrest or, you know, heart attack or something serious. Toothache, which can be, you know, uh, monitored, uh, you know, uh, you know, managed easily by some painkillers, and then ask the patient to come to the clinic. But ulcerative gingiva is actually more serious and can uh, be an indication of serious, uh, 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 you know, uh, diseases. Okay. Advantage of telemedicine. I will not read all of them because we we already went uh, through them. You know. It reduces stress, reduces uh, risk of uh, transmission of, of uh, diseases. It actually reduces health inequity. So it it, it, it enables everybody to receive uh, health. It, en it enables different kind of people, different type of people to receive, receive health, which means it, it, it actually provides some sort of equality and some sort of equity, which is something we always, always look for and, uh, you know, look for and, and advise uh, for in, in public health as public health practitioner, practitioner. This is very important. I know it, it of course, has some, uh, you know, scheduling benefits of reducing time of waiting, you know, travel, travel time, things like that. It's also very good for education. You can educate through, uh, uh, you know, telemedicine and telehealth because you can provide information while people at home, students at home, even patients at home. It's good to, and provide higher access to care and, and can deliver the, the, uh, the, uh, the care, the, services during different occasions, especially the occasion of pandemic. So you can read this. It has so many benefits that are very uh, important and very useful for uh, patients, for actually healthcare providers, and healthcare providers prefer that so they can have a higher level of services, uh, you know, with less anxiety from patients and be able to see more patients and uh, be able to monitor a patient with chronic diseases. So it's, it's efficient, it's effective in a lot of the cases, and you can reduce the cost and burden that uh, is produced by physical uh, existence and you know uh, the ability of some patients to pay or not to pay it, it has so many advantages that telehealth and telemedicine uh, uh, could promise and, and be able to uh, you know advance our uh, healthcare there are some obstacles of course there is nothing perfect there is nothing perfect 
Imagine people who have low, uh, low level of education or low health literacy. And health literacy, we mentioned that in the, uh, uh, you know, one of the previous slides about rural health, that those people who cannot read or understand any information related to health. So there are some people like that, older people, people with low level of education, people, uh, you know, uh, living in distant area. So how we can they use telehealth in the way people, educated people in urban areas can use. So there is a difference. So this is also part of inequity that we should address and know. Operational technical failures. There are so many, you know, problems happen through the internet with, you know, devices, uh, you know, connection, uh, uh, so many technical issues that could happen at any time and it happened and, and people might face it. Also financial problems and medical legal considerations because there are some legal issues about you know exposing a patient over the internet trying to to you know investigate something or able to pay and not to pay, pay some people might claim this is not a physical visit why should I pay the full service so there are some issues regarding this as well uh, also there are differences uh, in high income country middle and low income countries in applying these these tele uh, things so not all countries can be at the same level and so this is also a problem if some uh, you know uh, globally some services were transferred to be uh, uh, you know uh, electronically how uh, many countries would have suffer suffer from adapting this and be able actually to uh, uh, you know follow up with countries of high income uh, also viruses and malware and this is a problem in any device that can breach your uh, information, the patient's data, the privacy, and, and make cause a lot of problems for patients. May, patients may be scared of that because of, you know, they don't trust the, these uh, uh, the information to go through easily and securely. There are some future promises. I will read them, uh, you know, uh, quickly. Uh, it might show us a promise to detect cancer early. And this is actually some many cancer patients come at the lat, lat, latest stage, like type four or something of cancer, because they were just postponing. You know, they feel there is something wrong there, but but they were postponing. Imagine when we talked about asynchronous service. Asynchronous, when you have something, you take the pictures or complaints and you send it out to the healthcare providers, and on their own pace, they provide you with an answer. So you might actually provide information through the portal uh, you know, uh, of the patients or send the, your healthcare providers with information that's a little bit suspicious. And then the patient, the doctor will tell you, you need to see me uh, you know, uh, uh, quickly. And then you feel there's something wrong. So it might help to early detect cancer. Specifically, if we can actually, if you, uh, there are programs, the programs uh, you know, in artificial intelligence, that are promising that if you tell the symptoms and take some pictures, the computer by the intelligence of the you know, computer will try to uh, you know, suggest some possible disease that you might have. And this is a promise, we, we, it's not yet applied, but could happen, you, we don't know. Also improved surveillance system in rural areas. And this is important because the WHO a long time ago uh, advised to use telehealth in rural areas and distant areas and even poor countries and countries with uh, low advancement, other countries can help. So that can be a global actual effort to help each other. Higher feasibility of research because we can transfer information, transfer data through the electronic devices, through, uh, you know, e-health and through, uh, you know, the new technology over the internet. So we can have data that can be shared between different scientists and professors and can improve uh, research also can improve uh, services and diagnosis in rural areas, especially again across countries. So let's give an example, they might a rare disease in a village in Africa who none of the doctors there could, if any doctor actually exists, could actually diagnose. So they may send pictures and symptoms uh, to some, you know, uh, uh, affiliated a clinic or big center in one of the European countries, for example, they can help with diagnosis and give instructions. So this can be very helpful to have some a sort of a global commitment, as we mentioned in previous, uh, you know, uh, uh, lectures and global leadership commitment. So better also education for medical students. Medical students nowadays, you know, there are so many medical students all over the world, a lot of information, so many medical schools. 
So with this sharing of, of information, medical information through telehealth, and you can, you know, probably see that there are so many ways to learn through the internet. Medical students can benefit from this as well. Uh, I came to the end of this uh, presentation, and I went quickly this time. Sorry, I know it's Friday, and everybody is, is uh, ready to maybe have their uh, weekend vacation. Uh, thank you very much, and uh, please, I'm open to any kind of question or discussion if you have. So, um, I would like to take this opportunity to thank uh, uh, Dr. Rami Sadek for uh, this very interesting uh, presentation as well. Um, it was uh, great to um, welcome Dr. Sadek uh, from Jordan to our program. Uh, we very much appreciate um, uh, Dr. Sadek for his effort to um, uh, visit our university and give um, this series of consecutive lectures and share his knowledge uh, uh, with us uh, and take this extra step, uh, even during this time of pandemic, uh, to come and visit us and, and get to know each other. Um, we um, have benefited a lot uh, from uh, Dr. Sarek's uh, depth and breadth of knowledge on this important topic uh, related to um, several issues of public health. Um, it is a great pleasure uh, to have uh, completed this series of lectures, uh, also uh, recorded and will be available uh, on uh, our university's website uh, for um, students to listen uh, at their own time. We hope that this uh, great opportunity uh, we'll uh, continue with um, a long-term collaboration uh, since we have opened this pathway of uh, uh, communication with the University of Science and Technology in Jordan and specifically with Dr. Sadek. Thank you, Dr. Sadek. Um, if there's any uh, other question or a comment from the participant who would happy uh, to uh, uh, allow for some uh, more few minutes for this presentation. Thank you. Any questions, any ideas, any suggestions? I would be happy to hear them. Okay, uh, thank you everyone. Um, I'm seriously glad to, to be sharing you know, things I know with you and be able to hear your uh, voice on uh, several interesting topics for me. Uh, hopefully to see you again in the future uh, and have a great night. Everyone, bye.